The Marvel Cinematic Universe, aka the MCU, a shared universe of films that was created by Kevin Feige and Marvel Studios, has ushered in a new era of comic book films. No one can deny the meticulous craftsmanship that Feige and his team of artists have put into these films. And while they may seem perfect at first glance, you can't get to such high levels of success without a few bumps in the road. Like any work of art, the MCU has had numerous behind the scenes issues that have changed its trajectory for better or for worse. Fans were excited when it was announced that the third film in the Iron Man franchise would finally see the introduction of the Mandarin, Tony Stark's arch enemy. It turned out that the Mandarin in the film was actually an actor doing the bidding of the film's real villain, Ulrich Killian, played by Guy Pearce. I am the Mandarin! In an early draft of the script, the real villain was going to be none other than Rebecca Hall's Maya Hansen, an old friend of Tony's. According to writer and director Shane Black, Marvel executives insisted that no one would buy any action figures if the villain was female. Black had no choice but to swap the character's gender. Much of the blame went towards Marvel chairman Ike Perlmutter, who has butted heads with Kevin Feige numerous times. It's a shame that had to be the case, as Hall's Maya Hansen had tons of potential and could have been the first female villain for the MCU, an honor that was later bestowed upon Kate Blanchett's Hela in Thor Ragnarok. The MCU as we know it was born out of the words Nick Fury uttered in the now iconic Iron Man post credit scene. In it, Fury teased the Avengers initiative, telling Tony Stark that he isn't the only superhero in the universe. It turns out that an alternate version of the scene was filmed that mentioned Spider-Man's radioactive bug bites and the mutants from X-Men. That scene had to be cut as Marvel didn't have the right to Spider-Man or the X-Men at the time, but it shows just how vast the MCU's vision was in the earliest of days. A decade after the scene was filmed, Marvel has all of its characters under its belt even if it wasn't easy getting them all. It's fair to say that one of the weakest films to come out of the MCU was Thor The Dark World. Originally, Patty Jenkins was hired to direct the character's second solo outing but was let go from her directorial duties shortly thereafter. Jenkins' version of the Thor sequel was based on Romeo and Juliet and would have focused on Thor and Jane's forbidden love. Shortly afterwards, Game of Thrones director Alan Taylor was brought on board to replace Jenkins. It's been reported that Natalie Portman was displeased that Marvel let Jenkins go, who would have been the studio's first female director. With the Romeo and Juliet plot, it's fair to say that Natalie Portman's Jane Foster would have had a more substantial role. Years later though, Jenkins would go on to direct DC's Wonder Woman, the first modern day female superhero movie. Most fans seem to forget that the quick-witted and sarcastic War Machine was originally played by Terrence Howard. Howard's tenure as Colonel James Rhodey only lasted for the first Iron Man film, which briefly teased the character donning the War Machine suit. As soon as the first film became a success, Marvel was quick to begin working on the sequel. It turned out that director Jon Favreau was having a hard time working with Howard and didn't feel keen on seeing him return to the role. At the same time, Marvel approached Howard to notify him that they'd be cutting his salary, stating that the film would be a success with or without him. Howard, who signed the three-picture contract, was quickly replaced by Don Cheadle. While it's still annoying that the actor continuity is inconsistent, in the end, this was one of those changes that actually worked for the MCU, as it's hard to imagine anyone else besides Don Cheadle playing War Machine. Some of the most heartfelt and beautiful scenes in Avengers Endgame came from the adorable Alexandra Rabe who played the young Morgan Stark. It turns out that we were supposed to get one more scene from Tony's daughter. After Tony's snap, we were supposed to see him meet an older Morgan played by Catherine Langford. The scene was supposed to mirror the moment when Thanos was face to face with a younger Gamora. In the scene, both of the Starks would have shared a heartfelt moment together with the older Morgan acknowledging the risk her father took. What's important about this scene was that it would have introduced us to an older Morgan, which in turn informally gave us a vision into the future of the MCU. Morgan could have easily been set up as a successor to the Iron Man mantle, but ultimately the Russo brothers cut the scene from the final film, severing all ties with rising star Catherine Langford. One of Kevin Feige's greatest hiring choices was getting geek icon Josh Whedon on board to write and direct The Avengers the first film to truly show what the MCU was capable of. 
It was a no-brainer when it was announced that Whedon would be returning to write and direct the Avengers sequel, Age of Ultron. Expectations were high for the sequel, and while they were mostly met, many found the film to be filled to the brim with content that just didn't need to be there. It turns out that Whedon and Marvel had a quite the fallout as the studio forced the director to shoehorn in scenes like the mystical pool scene that set up Thor Ragnarok. The studio even threatened to cut out some of his favorite moments like Hawkeye's farm if he hadn't played ball. By the end of the film's production, Whedon described himself as broken and found the entire ordeal to be unpleasant, leaving the MCU for good. Whedon would later join Patty Jenkins over at DC, working on 2017's Justice League while director Zack Snyder took a leave of absence. Another director who had to leave Marvel behind was Edgar Wright, who was working on Ant-Man for over a decade. Wright was a huge fan of the property and was taking his sweet time with the character, making it just right for its live-action debut. Edgar Wright's plans for Ant-Man was so far along that he even shot test footage that premiered at San Diego Comic-Con to roaring applause. As production grew nearer, it became clear to Wright that the studio wanted him to make the film more and more connected to the MCU. Months before filming was about to begin, Wright left the project because he just couldn't see head-to-head -head with the Marvel team. That being said, some of Ant-Man's greatest casting choices, which include Paul Rudd as Scott Lang and Michael Douglas as Hank Pym, were all Wright's decision. So, we do have to give him some kudos there. Let's be honest. Hulk only became cool in the MCU once Mark Ruffalo took on the role in 2012's The Avengers. Since Ruffalo became the Hulk, fans have been begging for Marvel to give him a shot at leading his own movie. And while Ruffalo would love to headline his own movie as Dr. Bruce Banner, he has no choice but to be a supporting character in other heroes' movies. Universal holds the distribution rights to the Hulk, which means that Disney and Universal would have to spend time negotiating. Although Universal may hold the rights to the character, Disney has found the perfect legal loophole by having Ruffalo's Hulk appear in tons of MCU films as a supporting character. It isn't ideal, especially because Ruffalo does such a bang-up job of portraying the tormented beast, but we'll take what we can get. James Gunn was fired from Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 in 2018 after some inappropriate tweets surfaced. While the tweets were in poor taste, they lined up with Gunn's gross-out humor scene in his earlier films. DC, realizing that this was their time to shine, swept up Gunn and gave him the keys to the kingdom. Gunn ultimately landed on the Suicide Squad's sequel slash reboot, which is set to hit theaters in the summer of 2021. As time passed, Marvel realized that they prematurely fired one of their finest auteurs and got him reinstated back into his original role. While Marvel definitely lost face for their hasty decision, their main issue comes in the film's production being drastically delayed, essentially changing the course for the MCU. Filming on Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, which was supposed to begin in 2019, was pushed back, and there is still no word on when the film's production will actually begin because of what is happening in the world at the moment. The summer of 2019 was a devastating one for Marvel fans. As if seeing Tony Stark perish at the hands of the snap wasn't enough in Endgame, Fans were blown away when J. Jonah Jameson leaked Spider-Man's identity at the end of Far From Home. Spider-Man's name is Peter Parker. What the and while the cliffhanger from the film left us wanting more, there was a brief period where we thought that would be the end of Spidey. After Far From Home hit theaters, Marvel and Sony went back to the negotiating table to figure out the character's future in the MCU. Alas, both parties couldn't reach a deal, and for a brief time, Sony was going to develop its own Spider-Man film without Kevin Feige to steer the ship. After tons of fan outcry and Tom Holland himself trying to get the issue fixed, both parties have now come together for a third Spider-Man film. While it may have ended well for both Marvel and Sony, this whole debacle proved how volatile the entire situation is. It feels as if Spider-Man, Marvel's most beloved character, is always on ice that seems to thin after each film's release. Well, there you have it, some of Marvel's biggest behind-the-scenes issues that changed the MCU's trajectory forever. With Phase 4 just on the horizon, we can only hope that the creative process is much more streamlined. Make sure to keep an eye on Heroic Hollywood for all the latest entertainment news, be sure to subscribe to our channel, 
and check out our other videos. Let us know in the comments if you're excited to see what's next for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Thank you for watching this video.